How's it going? Charles Botenston here at BPI HQ is what I want to say. A lot of people ask about banking and finance. They want to get into buying or selling and they want to do it quickly. They don't, they kind of just want to just go right into the process. The number one thing is actually talking with the banker, not only the banker, but the broker. And obviously, yes, does the banks matter? We're going to cover it all today about pre-approval, how to get pre-approved, miscellaneous things, especially going into a co-op, you know, the monthly fees and things like that. So number one is they call it a private priority letter, obviously from the Dodd-Frank, a lot of things got kind of just rearranged. One of them was closing costs, which kind of got pushed down to the consumer. They also started, you know, saying that we're responsible with this and not responsible with that when it comes to the banking. Um, so number one is when you're actually searching for a home, why do you actually need a pre-approval letter? Number one is you want to know your monthly amount, okay? Because you have two areas. Number one is what you pay in maintenance, if it's a co-op or uh, common charges and taxes for a condo and obviously what you're going to pay for your mortgage. Your mortgage in the beginning is probably going to be about, I don't know, 85% interest and about 15% principal. So the interest is obviously the 3.75 or whatever the case is uh, that you get. You also can actually put in an offer, at least in New York City, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but in New York City without a pre-approval letter, priority letter, whatever you want to call it, they obviously have a pre-qual, which we'll just talk about that really quick, which is a pre-qualification, which is you, you say, I make this amount, I have this amount, and this is roughly my credit score. You get a pre-qualification letter, highly recommend. You don't ever do that ever at any time. The pre-approval letter is, or the priority letter is you have to prove how much income you have, how much money you have, what your credit score is. So you obviously have to go through the credit report and, and finding out if you're actually working with a buyer's agent, which I highly recommend, is that once you have that, you give it to them and you say, hey, listen, I'm pre-approved up to, they actually take you a little bit more seriously because it shows, you know what, I'm gonna be proactively not only involved in this process, it's kind of a team effort, but you also understand a little bit more about where the interest rates are. This is not the end all be all because most people, they, they get, pre-approved up to say, or priority letter up to a million dollars, but the co-op is not gonna allow them to borrow that amount of money because their monthlies are too high. That is the reason, one of the sole reasons to work with a real estate agent, a real estate professional, not like your nephew Chris, or your aunt Millie, just because someone in your family member or your friends or your social circle is licensed doesn't mean that you have to work with them. And to be honest, this is the biggest asset you're gonna probably buy or sell in your life. You need a professional in your corner and there's a process to it. That's really what it comes down to. There's a process to debt to income ratio, which we'll talk about in another video, post-closing liquidity, liquidity, and then obviously credit. We already talked about credit, but when it comes down to the actual amount of money that you're borrowing and your monthlies to borrowing, that all makes a difference getting into a co-op, all right? So moving into this is that another reason is this has happened way too many times is I'll get a email or a, a message or something like that and someone says, hey, listen, my, my coworker or my colleague or my friend or whoever is looking to buy a place and they've already been looking for six months. They already discovered the property that, that they want to see through all the open houses and then they say, hey, listen, I want to buy this property. And I'm like, whoa, you know. What's your finances? Fill out this revenue financial form. What, you know, did you get pre-qualified? Did you get pre-approved? Did you get your priority letter? What's the number? When did you get it? When did it expire? What's what's the rates? You have to start from the beginning and you have to do it properly. And the reason being is you don't want to fall in love with a property that you can't afford because that, that property needs say seventy-five or a hundred thousand dollars worth of work. And if you can't afford that hundred thousand dollars. The bank isn't gonna loan into you. You know, construction loans are probably nil when it comes to actual individual loans. And then on top of that is that you are actually looking in a price range that you may not be able to afford when it comes to a co-op. With a condo, it's a little bit different because they can't say no. They have to obviously give you the first right of refusal. As well as when you do your research before, maybe you're just thinking about buying, maybe you're just thinking about purchasing a home or it's your second home or you're looking at an investment property. Obviously, yes, there's plenty of websites that give you the, the current rate. Obviously, all the banks, you know, Wells City, Chase, Bank of America, but go to a mortgage calculator and type in, there's so many different loans and we're gonna be talking about that. Obviously, you know, adjustable rate, then you have a 15 year fixed, 30 year fixed, but look at what your, your monthly rates are gonna be. Because if you are paying, say, $5,000 in rent and your monthlies say that is a one and a 
half bedroom, or it's a one bed home office. You know, 5,000, that's probably like a $900,000 prop. Nah, probably even less. You know, it depends on how much money you actually put down. But say that's a $850,000 property or a $800,000 property, whatever it is. You have to understand is that if you put down more money, your monthlies are gonna be lower. Okay, if you put down the minimum, which is 20% getting into co-ops, 10% uh, getting into condos, but obviously the bank requires 20%, your monthlies are gonna be pretty high. Your, your, your maintenance and mortgage combined is gonna be over $5,000, $6,000, and you're saying, well, actually I'm used to spending $5,000, and now it's gonna be $6,000, and if you didn't actually budget that in a monthly budget, you're spending an extra $1,000 or $2,000 a month, that's gonna cut away from not only just the amount of money you're saving, but also a lot of people call it house poor. You know, you're kind of house poor. So look at the monthly rates, plug it into a mortgage calculator. There's a ton of websites out there that have mortgage calculators, and then include obviously the maintenance. Those are all things that you want to talk about with your with your agent. Here's a couple of miscellaneous things that I, I plugged down, which is the more you put down, the less your monthlies. Look at your income, look at your credit, look at all the assets that you have. Uh, a lot of people, they kind of shun away all the debt that they may have. It could be from a boat, another home, a car payment, student loans, or even credit card loans that are, are on an installment level. And they shun that away and I say, whoa, you know, where's this $50,000? You know, why do we owe $50,000? You know, those are things that co-ops are gonna be looking at, banks are gonna be looking at. So it's just really a, a whole circular area. Running credit, you can do it once a year for free without dinging your credit. Highly recommend you do that. You can go to My FICO, which gives you the score, or you go to, I think it's myfreecreditreport.com. Go back to my other video and I actually have it for free. All the three big credit agencies allow you to run it at least once a year in a, in a one year time span. And a lot of people look at it as, there's bankers and brokers. You know, the, the benefit of having a broker, uh, a mortgage broker, which is someone that can shop it around. I really only, I think there's only one time recently that someone has actually shopped around. You know, and I'm not talking about shopping around between banks. I mean, working with a mortgage broker, someone that can shop around for you. I know Wells Fargo, I think you have to go directly to Wells Fargo if you want to originate a loan with Wells Fargo. In other words, you can't go through a broker, not a real estate broker, but a mortgage broker. So you have to go directly to them as a bank. And to be honest, that I think that's worth it because unless you have dire circumstances or you need to borrow a certain amount of money or you just don't have the best financial situation, you know, going directly to Chase, City, HSBC, Wells Fargo, whatever, Bank of America, doesn't really matter, whatever bank you wanna to go to, you wanna to go to them directly because then they don't add their commission which is what a mortgage banker does. They add their commission on top of the rate or they charge you points. There's clever ways that they actually get paid out. Um, moving on, one of the other larger things that when you're looking online is that there's a lot of misinformation. You know, there's online lenders. You know, there's there's places that say, hey, listen, I'll, I'll give you this amount of money at a lower interest rate. But the problem is a lot of co-ops, they want big banks. The reason they want big banks is because a lot of people, they went with smaller, you know, say, you know, smaller banks. And I always go to the co-op and I say, hey, listen, is it, do you think this bank is gonna be approved by the co-op? Because smaller banks, 2009, a lot of them collapsed. I don't know the number, but it's probably hundreds of banks either got consolidated, they collapsed, they couldn't pay their financial interest back to the government. And the reason being is that because all the people that went to them, they lost their jobs, their, their home is under the, uh, was underwater. In other words, they owed more than it was actually worth. So all these people that were at, say, you know, regional banks or local banks, all of them collapsed. And then what happened to their loan? You know, it either got consolidated, they went into foreclosure, they had a short sale, things like that. So online lenders, highly recommend you don't go to it in New York City. I think most people are smart enough that they go to the bank of choice that they are, that they're with. When it comes to the different types, you obviously have a fixed rate, you have an adjustable rate, and obviously talk to your lender about all these things. But this is obviously coming from someone from 10 years of experience that has done, dealt with God knows how many different types of bankers and different types of banks. The first one is 30 years. So why 30 years? I think it was more of an established premise that 30 years you'd be living there for 30 years. And to be honest, I think if you're in the suburbs, the, the average rate is around 15 years. Is it, it actually might be higher now. 
you know, my parents have been in their house for almost 40 years. You know, I, I, I know a lot of other people. And the reason being is that you raise your children in, and that's obviously, you know, just the premise of it. You raise your children in there. It probably takes, you know, say two to three years, they're kids, then they go through college, then they're 22, whatever. So that's already 20 something years. Then then they're out of the house and then you think about selling it and moving back to the city or, or selling it and downsizing or selling it. And then you have a place in California and a place in New York or whatever, the, whatever your case is. But 30 years, that was the premise. And actually probably back in the day, it was, I don't know how many people, once they buy a home, it took them 30 years before they either passed away or they were able to actually sell it and pay off their mortgage. So 15 years, if you do 15 years, obviously that's a totally different rate because you're paying it off at a shorter time frame. Also there's 10 years and 20 year terms. Uh, those are not as uh, popular. Adjustable rate mortgages. So this this is something that you really want to talk to your, your real estate agent about and obviously the bankers that uh, adjustable rate mortgage, usually a five year, seven year are the most popular ones. And I, I just had a client that actually, they took a five year knowing they were going to sell in five years. I would not recommend taking anything less. You know, I think, I don't know if there is anything less, but if you want to be safe, do a seven year uh, adjustable rate mortgage. They look very sexy. Their, their mortgage rates will look fantastic. But the problem is when you do a seven year as opposed to a five year is that it's adjustable. So after the seventh year, it goes straight up. It goes into stratosphere. It goes into 18%. It goes into 1980 rates. All right. So when you actually do that, you have to rate And There's obviously a three year as well. I don't recommend that. That's uh, maybe a bridge loan. Maybe that's a construction loan that you want to do is just say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to live here while my, my home is getting built or something like that. And you know, you're going to sell. Um, I don't recommend three years at all because you have too, too much on the closing costs on the front end and on the back end, obviously with the real estate agent that you have to pay to sell the home. The five year is something that you want to kind of dial it down depending on your life situation. If you're going to be there, if you're not going to be there, if you're going to, you know, maybe upsize or downsize your home within five years. But I would say seven years, that's a good time frame. Unless you're going to be there, obviously over seven years, then you want to do 15 or 30 year fix. A couple of things that I, I wrote down here that I just wanted to, to talk about is that when you actually go for a mortgage, you're not and you're talking to city. Um, then you're not actually dialed into city just because they give you a priority letter doesn't mean that that's the person you want to go with. Okay. The second thing I, I want to bring up as well is a lot of banks, they make it, they say, Oh, if you work with us or if you move money to our bank, then we'll give you closing costs or we'll give you, you know, some kind of incentive to go with them. You know, we'll knock off, you know, a point or two or something like that is that you have to understand is that there is a difference between banks and the processes. There's difference between the even bankers and their processes. You know, the people that we deal with are only the best because I'm not going to give my client someone that's brand new or doesn't know what they're doing. I want someone that's a veteran in the bank that can push maybe a loan through or that understands all the different regulations that are coming down to the consumers from the government. Dot Frank, and obviously just every single year there's there's new different regulations and, and it's just a little bit overwhelming to be honest at this point. Um, I would also look at the, the last thing I'll say about that is it's not all about the interest rate. Yes, it, it seems like it is, but I actually one time a, a client almost lost the deal because they went with the interest rate, but it was a newer, there's, there's banks that want to lend, which is Wells Fargo. And then there's really big commercial banks. And I'm not talking about Goldman and Deutsche Bank and things like that. I mean like large ones like Chase and Bank of America that if you don't have a significant amount of assets, you're probably not going to be their priority on their list. But if you're at a MNT or maybe not even MNT, I forgot the name, but if you go with Wells, that's what they want to do. You know, there's, there's the commercial side, there's the retail side. Those are the ones that they sort of want to lend, but not really want to lend. And then you go to someone like Wells. I would say the first thing you want to do is talk to a real estate agent. You talk to a banker that they recommend. Then the banker, you and the buyer, obviously you get together on a conference call and you say to get into the bank, I understand that the bank is willing to give you $2.5 million or $1.5 million or whatever the case is, but actually due to debt to income ratio, we can only look for a million to 1.5 or, or 1.5 to $2 million. I know you want to spend more and I know that's really where you see some beautiful, lovely homes, but to get into the, the co-op that is totally different. And, and, and with that, this is the, this is the biggest difference is that it may have changed, but banks, 
uh, they required a 43% debt to income ratio. So, so say you make $100, 43% or lower is how much leaves, and this is before taxes, leaves your bank account. As a co-op, 25%, 20% is really the standard up to, depending on how liberal the co-op the, the co is, it could be up to 30%. But obviously you have to have money down, and, or not money down, but money in the bank afterwards, you have to have good credit, you know, the ideal candidate, ideal financial candidate. So if you guys have any questions, hopefully this was uh, very, you know, not only just, uh, I, I guess a little bit enlightening, but it also gives to the importance that you just don't want to jump into the process. You have to trust the process. You have to trust the bank, the broker, the professionals that you're working with, not only for the attorney side, but the broker side, the management, you know, there, there's just so many different moving parts. Um, I would say that if you do have any questions, obviously leave in the comments below. Charles at Botenston is my personal email. And as always, if you have any, anything you want me to discuss, I'm going to be putting together, you know, just more and more kind of buyer, um, you know, buyer guides, but specifically areas that are very uh, minute or the minutia of buying, especially when it comes to banks, because that's a, it's a pretty big portion of buying a home is getting the money if you don't have cash. So have an amazing day.